So it's my great pleasure uh, to welcome here as our distinguished lecturer today, Dr. Thomas Santholm from Carnegie Mellon University, where uh, he is affiliated not only with the computer science department, but also with, um, as you can actually see there as well, with the machine learning department, and also with an interesting joint program with the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, this is a joint PhD program in computational biology. Um, at the CNUCS department, he has founded and is presently the director of the Electronic Marketplaces Laboratory. Um, his research spans an amazing gamut of areas. If I were to tell you about all of them, I would still be at it in 15 minutes. I don't think you would like that or Thomas would like that, so I'm just going to give you some highlights. Um, so the research uh, is in game theory, particular mechanism design, and a whole bunch of other areas related to that, multi-agent systems and electronic commerce. There's another strand that is uh, in AI and machine learning, a third strand that's in optimization, empirical algorithmics, and complexity. And uh, he's also very well known for developing uh, some of the best poker playing programs currently uh, in existence. So uh, that in alone is a very impressive achievement. His background uh, includes a PhD and an MSc in computer science from the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, uh, as well as a graduate degree in industrial engineering and management science from Helsinki University of Technology in Finland. Um, Thomas Santholm um, holds many honors, and once again, the, the list is way too long to go through it. So I just picked a few that I found particularly impressive. Um, he, uh, in, in 1997, uh, he got a National Science Foundation Career Award. Um, in 2001, he was awarded the inaugural ACM Auto uh, Autonomous Agents Research Award. Um, in 2003, he got uh, the biggest award uh, for young researchers in computer science, which is the Kuchkai Computers and Thought Award. Uh, and in 2008, he was, uh, he was made a fellow of the uh, ACM and also of the AAAI. Um, these are basically the highest achievements you can get uh, in the area um, of, of AI uh, and beyond. Um, what's particularly impressive about Thomas is that not only academically has he been prolific and has had an amazing impact and continues to have an amazing impact, but he's also had always sort of a parallel life going focus on applications and real world impact. Um, and again, there wouldn't be much to talk about, just a few highlights. Um, from 1997 uh, until 2010, he was the chairman and uh, CTO chief scientist of Combinet, um, which then got acquired. Um, he currently is uh, the founder and CEO of Optimized Markets, which uh, is uh, developing um, sort of the next generation of advertising, sales, and, and scheduling uh, ideas. Um, he has been a redesign consultant of Baidu-sponsored um, search auctions. Um, he's worked as a consultant advisor and board member for a host of companies, including Google and Yahoo. Um, and finally, um, his algorithms um, do run the US-wide uh, UNOS kidney exchange, which is the topic of today's talk. And you can see here on the slide that he serves in various functions related um, to, to that area of work. I personally met Thomas, I think, in the late 90s, so we've known each other for a long time, and I was always very impressed with you know, all the stuff that he's doing that, that's really very marvelous. Um, so, and it goes much beyond what I told you. So, for example, um, where is Thomas going tomorrow? He's going to Maui, actually. Why is he going to Maui? Um, that's because he also is a competitive windsurfer, and there he will hone his skills uh, on something called the forward loop, which scares me even to think about. Um, but that's not today's topic, so I very much look forward to hearing Thomas uh, talk about uh, modern dynamic kidney exchange, and please join me in welcoming him uh, here to our distinguished lecture series. Well, thank you very much. Uh, that was such a nice introduction that it's all going to be downhill from here. I should probably just sit down and go home. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk about modern dynamic kidney exchanges, and first, um, let me say thank you uh, to NSF for funding and Microsoft Research for funding on this and then to my uh, collaborators. And we've been at this since about 2005-2006. Uh, so there's a whole slew of papers. I'm not going to talk about all of them, but I'm going to talk about some aspects of these papers that you see on the slide. So uh, uh, collaborators include my PhD student John Dickerson, uh, my colleague Ariel Prokacha, um, host, a host of people from UNOS, United Network for Organ Sharing, um, which is the main kidney exchange I'm going to be talking about. Um, uh, PhD student Pranjala Wasti, a bunch of um, doctors, um, including especially Michael Reese, who runs the Alliance for Pair Donation. Um, some economists like Al Roth and Utko Unver, 
Uh, Al Roth actually just got the Nobel Prize for matching this fall, so it's nice to finally have a Nobel Prize winning co-author. Um, and and uh, David Abraham and Avrin Bloom er early on on our first paper on kidney exchange. Okay, um, so uh, kidneys uh, filter waste from blood, and most people get born with two kidneys. Uh, kidney disease is really a nasty disease, and it spreads across uh, different uh, segments of the world, so developed world, developing world, uh, different ethnicities, uh, race, gender, so it's a kind of a cross-cutting disease, and uh, it's a big problem. So in the U.S. alone, over 50,000 people get lethal kidney disease each year. And this number is going up. For various reasons, uh, this is becoming a bigger problem in the future. One treatment is dialysis. So if the kidneys fail to filter waste from blood, you can actually get hooked up to a machine that's going to filter the waste out. But now you're spending multiple hours per week Multiple, or multiple days per week, multiple hours at a time, in a dialysis center, and it's hard to uh, be part of the productive society uh, in that mode. And uh, quality of life is really low. It's actually so low, that it's, and it's hard to imagine it as a healthy person, but most people on dialysis decide to stop dialysis and die instead. Only 12% make it 10 years. A more permanent solution is a transplant. So you can take a kidney from somebody else and transplant it into the sick person and that person is going to be fine. And why do we look at kidneys? Well, kidney transplants are by far the most prevalent organ transplant. More prevalent than all other organ transplants combined. I'm going to, at the end of the talk, talk about liver lobes as well, but that's some new uh, forward thinking stuff that's not reality. The kidney exchange is reality. Um, there's a big waiting list for cadaveric kidneys. So if somebody gets into a motorcycle accident, for example, and their kidney is fine, or kidneys are fine, you can take those kidneys and transplant them into somebody else. The waiting list is about 94,000 people at this point in the US, and the average waiting time is two to five years, depending on your blood type. Uh, about 5,000 people die each year on the wait list. About 34,000 get added per year and uh, about 17,000 get a transplant. So uh, 11,000 of them get a diseased donor transplant and about 6,000 get a live donor transplant. So what this means is there's a huge imbalance between supply and demand and the queue just keeps getting longer and longer. Live donation is the idea that you can take one of a healthy person's kidneys and give that to the sick person and they can both live fine. It's actually illegal to buy or sell kidneys in most countries, including the US, but you can actually donate your kidney if you don't expect any compensation. So a family or friends can donate or you can ask for a kidney from your favorite computer science colleague. <laughs> okay, so, so this is where the idea of kidney exchange comes in. And this is um, an idea that was uh, proposed as early as 1986 by Steve Woodle, who's actually a surgeon and an ethicist. Uh, but in reality, these kidney exchanges only started around 2003-2004. Um, the, the, the problem, by the way, uh, with live donation just flat out is compatibility. So to do a kidney transplant, you have to be compatible. The donor and the patient have to be compatible for blood type, tissue type, and a few other factors, like you can't take a tiny person's kidney and put it into a huge person because there's just not enough power or filtration in the kidney, and so forth. Uh, so this is where the kidney exchange comes in. You have what we call pairs, each pair including a patient and a donor. So a patient with a willing donor, but incompatible. So you can think about, okay, you're willing to give to your um, daughter, but you can't because of incompatibility. And the, uh, you can have another pair where you have another donor and a patient who are also willing but incompatible. And at the simplest form, a kidney exchange includes swapping the donors. So donor one gives to patient two, and donor two gives to patient one, so that way both patients can live. This is called a two cycle. So we have two nodes in this cycle, pair one and pair two. 
You can also have longer cycles. For example, pair one giving to pair two, giving to pair three, giving to pair one. That would be a three cycle and so forth. Um, the kidneys usually travel inside the donor, so once we plan this type of a cycle, the healthy person typically travels to the sick person's transplant center for the transplant. Although nowadays we've been looking at transporting the kidneys on ice as well, which often happens with the diseased donor kidneys. It's not as good, but it's actually pretty good. It can be done that way as well. So now, uh, from a combinatorial optimization perspective, this is what we have. We have all of these willing but incompatible pairs. These are the nodes of a graph. And then we have edges in that graph that represent compatibility. So for example, edge E1 represents the fact that um, vertex V1 can give a kidney to vertex V2. And in this graph, we would have two, sorry, uh, three possible two cycles and one five cycle that would go through the outer arrows of that. Um, so uh, there are different options and you cannot get cycle one, cycle two and cycle three. Well, why not? That would mean that somebody's giving out two kidneys and then they would be left with nothing and they couldn't live. So, uh, you can, uh, so, so the problem here is to find the maximum weight combination of disjoint cycles. They have to be vertex disjoint. And uh, the weights, you could think about all transplants being equal. In that case, all the weights of the edges are one. Or we'll later talk about weights that are not one and why they're not one. But for um, the exposition, uh, purposes of keeping it easy to discuss for now, I'm going to talk about the zero one case where either there's a, an edge or there's not an edge. But uh, in reality, we do it weighted. So again, the objective is to find a maximum weight combination of these joint cycles. Kidneys are not the only thing you can exchange. There are other vital exchanges as well. So for example, there's one for holiday homes called Intervac. There's one for used books called Read It, Swap It. There's one for general used goods called NetCycler, which actually recently acquired a US one called Swap.com. And I've been doing some consulting for them. Um, there, uh, there's even one for shoes. That's called National Odd Shoe Exchange, where leg amputees or people with different size feet could potentially have their, have their shoe buying costs. <laughs> okay. Um, kidney exchange is uh, somewhat special in that there's a cap on the cycle length. Um, all of the transplants in a cycle must occur simultaneously. Otherwise, somebody whose patient has already received a kidney could say, oh, I'm having second thoughts. I'm not going to actually give a kidney. And now some pair is out their bargaining chip. They're out their kidney. Um, and you cannot contract, at least not in the US, for an organ. So I can't write a contract saying, that, OK, if I give Holger to uh, your friend, you're going to give to my friend. And I, well, after uh, I've given to his friend, I'm going to somehow take him to court if he refuses to give his kidney. That would not be allowed. Therefore, these, have to, these cycles have to, each cycle has to occur atomically at the same time. And the surgeons are actually on cell phones across the country from the different transplant centers that are executing a cycle at the same time saying, that I'm taking the kidney out now. So there's no option for somebody's spouse to come and yank them out of the operating room before the kidney is out or something like that. This makes it very difficult to coordinate a long cycle. A K cycle requires between 3K and 6K doctors, about 4K nurses, and 2K operating rooms. So if you have a three cycle, you have to coordinate six operating rooms exactly at the same time across the country. So that's one reason why uh, you don't want to have very long cycles. Another reason is robustness. A cycle may fail. There are reasons which we'll get to towards the end of the talk why Bland transplants actually don't go to transplant. For example, um, the, the most famous example is cross-matching. So the blood test knowledge is incomplete. If we take a blood test from me and one from Holger and the blood test says you're compatible, well, we may or may not be. And at the last minute, like a week or two before the operation, we take our bloods together, we shake them up, and if it cakes, if it coagulates, we're actually not compatible. 
So some of the edges in the graph that I just showed you are actually fake and they'll disappear on you before the actual operation. And if you have a long cycle, there are more edges that could fail and the whole cycle fails if even one of the edges fails. That's why the short cycles are more robust. And furthermore, if a cycle fails, if it's long, more patients are affected. Okay, so um, in the US, UNOS, United Network for Organ Sharing, US Wide Kidney Exchange, we set the cycle cap at three. And that's the typical way that kidney exchanges run now, nowadays. So we're looking for two cycles and three cycles. Um, turns out that this is a hard problem. We proved that this is NP complete for any cycle length cap of three or more. It's actually solvable in polynomial time with a cycle cap of two or without any cycle cap. So it's really, uh, this is one of those cases where reality happens to be exactly the hard case. The algorithm that I'm going to talk about in the first half of the talk finds a provably optimal solution. So this is an NP complete problem, but we're not intimidated. We, so we, we, we're finding the provably optimal solution anyway, uh, and typically fast. So I'm going to show you that we can scale this to 10,000 pairs in uh, less than two hours. Okay, uh, the prior state of the art before we started working on this um, was manual match, well, three different things. Manual matching of greedy algorithms. They don't find an optimal solution and the manual approach doesn't scale. Secondly, weighted maximum matching like, for example, Edmonds algorithm. This was also in use. Uh, it can only handle two cycles. And there are other limitations having to do with side constraints as well. And uh, some exchanges use CPLEX. And CPLEX is nice in that it supports all of the generality that our algorithm supports, but it doesn't scale beyond 600 to 900 pairs, as I'll, as I'll show you. Even if you have no weights, no chains, I'm going to talk about what chains are later, and a cycle cap of just three. Um, the designs and technology I'm going to be talking about are actually in use um, at the United Network for Organ Sharing, which is the government US-wide kidney exchange. Just a sec. It has about 130 transplant centers and it went live in October 2010. And it runs the algorithms and our software that I'm talking about. So we actually installed these at the UNOS headquarters in Richmond and every week when they press the optimize button, it's these algorithms that make the transplantation plan for the country. Question. Oh, yeah, I just had a question. Uh, how many different types of incompatibilities exist? Because I imagine that there's kind of a finite number of, of blood types uh, and other issues like that. And, 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 if, and if I take two random people, what's the probability that, that they'll be incompatible or incompatible? Okay, good, good. Uh, so there's, uh, uh, without going into too much uh, detail on the blood types, there are four different blood types and they form a DAG. So uh, O can give to anybody. A can give it to A or AB, B can give to B or AB, and AB can only give to B, a, a give to AB. Uh, there are tissue type, tissue type is multidimensional. Uh, for human leukocyte antigens, which is the main one, it's kind of six dimensional. Uh, but there are also other things uh, in tissue type which are partly understood. So the dimensionality of the incompatibility is actually bigger than we even know today. That's why I can't give you an answer. But these are like uh, blood type wise and HLA wise, that's the answer. And, and the probability is small if you pick any two random people. And if you pick anybody from these exchanges, it's even smaller. Because the fact that you haven't, you be, you're in the exchange and you haven't yet been matched, it's a bad signal about your type. Okay, um, Alliance for Pair Donation, that's a regional kidney exchange run by uh, Michael Reese. And we also uh, did some uh, runs for them uh, early on in the kind of 2006-2007 time frame. And a pair donation network, that was another regional kidney exchange out of Ohio. And now that's been shut down and the pool has been merged with the UNOS pool. Um, Alliance for Pair Donation, they, they've been merged with the UNOS pool, but they also do local uh, clearings themselves. And there was also one called the New England um, NEPKI, New England Paired Kidney Exchange which was actually the first kidney exchange and uh, they've also been merged into the, the UNOS exchange and they don't exist anymore. Okay, so I'm going to jump straight to our second algorithm. The first algorithm uh, 
didn't work so well. So if you're interested in what, what, what it was, it, yeah, you can read the paper. Uh, it's, uh, at the high level, we had variables on the edges saying, okay, do we take that edge or not? And then we did constraint generation to make sure that the cycles didn't get too long and uh, all of the cycles were actually cycles and so forth. And it didn't scale. So I'm going to jump straight to the second algorithm. This is the um, integer linear program with a cycle formulation. So let's say a capital C is a set of cycles that are not too long, not longer than our cap. We'll have one variable per cycle and our objective is to maximize the sum over the cycles of the weight of the cycle times the acceptance variable. So we'll say that x is 1 if we're taking the cycle and x is 0 if we're rejecting the cycle subject to the constraint that each vertex belongs to at most one cycle. Remember, we want a vertex disjoint cycle cover. Any questions on this? Okay. Um, this uh, program is actually too large to write down. So it's unlike winner determination in combinatorial auctions that we've also worked on a lot, and I know that uh, Kevin and Holger have worked on a lot, uh, in that there you start to run out of time first. It's all a game against time. Here is all a game against space. Um, the overall approach is uh, Branch and Price from Operations Research. Um, I'll talk through this in detail. But it's like branch, branch and Bound, except that you have a lot of special source for the bounding part. Um, you branch, you select a, a fractional variable, a sac fractional column in the program, or in other words, a cycle whose linear programming relaxation value is fractional, and you fix its value to 0 and 1 respectively, and then you look at each one of those subproblems, then you pick another cycle to branch on, and so forth. So you make a search tree, and you fathom the search nodes in the tree if there is no better solution that can come down that path than the best you found so far, which we call the incumbent. The Linear program relaxation that's computed uh, for the fathoming purposes is too big to write down, so we use column generation for that. So you can think about branch and price just simply being branch and bound where the LP bounding is done with column generation. Um, the master linear program, which we'll call P, has too many variables, so it won't fit into memory and it would take too long to solve even if it did. So we begin with a restricted linear program P prime, which contains some subset of the columns, in other words, a subset of the cycles that we're working with. And clearly we can only get the same or worse solution from that restricted LP than from the real LP. What we do, we solve the restricted LP and we add more variables to it incrementally on an as-needed basis until the optimal value from the restricted LP matches the optimal value of the real LP which we don't even know. Okay? Are you with me so far? Now I'm going to talk about uh, um, some more details that we put together on top of this basic framework, which is already known in OR. Um, actually, uh, so this, is still, this slide is still kind of standard. Um, the price of a column or a cycle um, is defined to be the weight of the cycle minus the sum of the dual linear programming values of the vertices that the cycle uses. So it's basically saying that is the value we're getting from this cycle good compared to the value we would get from those nodes if we use them in some other cycles. And if we have a positive price, that means yes, that's good. That's a hint to us that we might want to bring that cycle into our program as we generate these cycles on the fly. Um, the pricing problem then is to find a positive price cycle or report that none exists. And if there is no positive price cycle, it's actually easy to show that in that case you're done. You've solved the linear program optimally. And the key is that we check these cycles one by one without having all of the cycles in memory. Um, here are some techniques we put on top of that to make it faster. So we actually generate the cycles using depth first search in the input graph. Um, the vertices are explored in non-decreasing order of their dual linear program values. Um, and uh, we avoid repeating parent, the parent's pricing problem work in a child's pricing problem where we can prove that we don't have to. Then proving LP optimality. 
We know, as I mentioned, that once all of the cycles, all of the columns have non-positive prices, we have optimality. But that's only on implication, not on equivalence. Oftentimes we have optimality way before that. And uh, the problem is that we already have optimality typically, but we just can keep generating more and more columns. And that's called the tailing off effect. <coughs> uh, so our technique here for tackling this is that we're going to relax the cycle length constraint. So we're going to say you can have any length cycles. That's going to give us an upper bound on what we can accomplish at that node of the search tree. Uh, and we can compute that upper bound in polynomial time. And once the optimum of the restricted linear program matches that upper bound, then we know that we're done, even though we still have positive price cycles. And it turns out that often length three cycles are enough to match the unrestricted case. Uh, so oftentimes this allows you to stop the generation of the cycles and you get a big speed up in practice. Then let's talk about column seeding. So you may not want to start from an empty linear program and uh, do this uh, pricing problem from scratch. You might want to start with some linear program with some columns already in play. And you'd like to start with some that you think are promising. Um, one thing we do, we use a greedy randomized algorithm and we use a max weighted matching algorithm like Edmonds algorithm to come up with uh, cycles. We throw them in the pool and then we also for good measure throw another semi-random 400,000. It doesn't have to be 400,000 but uh, that, that, that really cuts down on the number of iterations you have to do in the column generation. Column management. Oftentimes you uh, get your memory full of columns and now you have to start removing some as you generate new ones. And um, um, only a small fraction of the columns end up being in the final solution. So there are huge numbers of cycles but in the optimal solution at the end of the day because the cycles have to be disjoint you're only going to have very few. So you can throw some of, the, some of them out and it's unlikely that you threw any of the good ones out. Uh, and if you did, the column generation is going to generate them for you again anyway. So you're not compromising optimality. And what we do, as you might guess now, delete, we delete the column with the largest negative price first. Because it's, in some sense, according to the linear program's opinion, uh, the most promising. Or the least promising. Primal heuristics. The goal here is to prune the search tree more without compromising optimality. Uh, the idea is that if we have good solutions early, we have good incumbents early, and therefore the pruning is going to uh, work better. We're going to construct integral so uh, solutions from the fractional LP optimum at each search node, and this gives a lower bound on the integral optimality. One idea is kind of a rounding heuristic. We include all of the cycles whose LP values are at least half, and then greedily select remaining uh, cycles if we can, as long as we don't violate the constraint that the cycles have to be non-overlapping. Turns out it really doesn't help. A, a more um, sophisticated uh, technique here uh, improves speed significantly though. Um, the restricted LP at the root node usually contains enough columns so that the integral optimum matches the fractional optimum. We use the CPLEX in mixed integer program as a primal heuristic but only on the restricted integer program that corresponds to the restricted LP P prime. So we're actually solving the restricted integer program now. And uh, we can uh, put a constraint that the ILP value has to match the fractional target and we have time limits and we only do this if the problem is now sufficiently different from its parent so we don't do redundant work. And this actually improves speed significantly. So now here's kind of the bottom line graph on what we've talked about so far. Um, this is uh, on data that's bigger than any real kidney exchange because we wanted to test scalability. So this is um, data made by a generator from a paper by Seidman et al. <coughs> Excuse me. On the x-axis I have the number of pairs. 
and 10,000 is on the right, that's a predicted size of the US-wide kidney exchange in steady state. On the y-axis there's clearing time, how long does this take to find and prove the optimal solution. <coughs> on the left here, this is CPLEX, it has all of the functionality that we do, we talked about that, but it doesn't scale beyond 600 or 900 pairs because it runs out of memory. It doesn't have this incremental uh, generation of the problem, it has to write the whole problem down up front and that's why it doesn't scale. On the right there's our algorithm and uh, you can see that we're doing the full US kidney exchange, projected kidney exchange size in uh, less than an hour on average. And in between we have variants of our algorithm where we have turned some of the techniques off just so we can isolate the relative contribution of the techniques. So the main mes message, uh, first of all I want to say that we are re-emphasize re the fact that we're finding the optimal solution. But when we talk about all of these heuristics, it's just to improve speed, we're not compromising optimality. And also it's the only algorithm, was in 07 and actually still is, that's um, scalable for this problem. Now let me talk a little bit more about other functionality of modern kidney exchanges that you want and how these can be uh, or are incorporated into the algorithm. One is multiple willing donors per patient. If you're a really nice person, maybe you can find more than one of your computer science colleagues to give you a kidney. Maybe everybody in the department is willing to give you a kidney. But in the um, algorithm, or the, the deal in a kidney, ex kidney exchange is that if you get one kidney, you only have to contribute one. But you could uh, come in with multiple alternate donors and that's going to increase your chances of finding a match. And that's actually very easy to increment, include in the algorithm. We just include all of their edges to that pair and the algorithm picks uh, uh, how to match and then we can post process and see which edge it actually used. Secondly, incorporating compatible pairs. So far we said that this is for incompatible but willing pairs. But you could actually throw compatible pairs here as well into the pool. And we actually had a case like this where at the Alliance for Pair Donation there was a 13-year-old um, girl, very sick, sick with kidney disease. And she had an older man, maybe it was a father or uncle, who was willing to give, but it was clear that that kidney wasn't going to last a lifetime in, in that girl. So they came to the exchange and said, okay, we'll give you three months. I'll look for a younger kidney. Uh, although we're ourselves compatible and if, if in three months you can't match it, we'll do it ourselves. Why would you want this? Well, a patient can get a better kidney and in this case a 13 year old did get younger, a younger kidney. Furthermore, it might help others in the pool get more or better matches. And the algorithm supports this um, directly. You can also put in a, a constraint that the patient can't get a worse kidney than her compatible donor brings. So you can pre-process out some of those compatible edges where we said, oh well that kidney is even older, well we're not going to allow that to happen and so forth. Uh, weights on edges. The al algorithm supports weights on edges and therefore as a special case also weights on the nodes. The weights can represent anything that the policy makers of the exchange want to represent. And in the UNAS case, we have largely inherited the weighting scheme from the decades of work that's gone into determining the weighting scheme for the disease donor waiting list. But these weights are typically designed by committee. I'll argue that you, you should use machine learning and so forth to, to determine these from data, but it's actually more complicated than that because it's not even clear what the overall goal is. If our all overall goal were just utilitarian, we could say that we want to maximize life extension with the exchange. Then we could actually go back and try to use machine learning uh, to try to do the weighting. But there's actually a trade-off between um, efficiency and fairness. And the medical community really thinks hard about efficiency, fairness trade-offs. 
So degrees of compatibility. For example, if you have a six-way HLA match, that kidney is going to last a very long time in the recipient. So we give priority for that. Projected life years. That might be an argument for transplanting young, younger people. Travel distance. It's actually amazing that some people are willing to give a major organ but are not willing to go on an airplane. But this is reality. Um, there's also logistical preference to, to, to locality. So that you get to work with the doctors you already know in your own transplant center instead of flying across country to do your transplant. Wait time. Uh, fairness, at least some notions of fairness would argue that people who have waited a long time should get some preferential treatment. And in the UNAS way, uh, kidney exchange, they do. From an efficiency perspective, of course, you would completely ignore that. Transplanting children. This is not just about extending life years. Turns out that uh, children, if you don't transplant them, not having a good kidney is actually going to stunt their growth as well. So there's actually an other argument for transplanting children. Or transplanting hard to match patient, patients. You might say that that's just a proxy for transplanting more overall, but actually there's some sort of inherent preference to transplanting hard to match patients uh, by, by some you know, policy mandate and so forth. So there are all of these interesting efficiency fairness questions as to what should be optimized. And these are typically, these weighting schemes are typically struck by hand by a policy committee or kidney exchange design committee. I'm, I'm on these conference calls. Um, and it's very interesting how different people see, see these things. But the actual operative day-to-day -day things, these life and death, death decisions and these millennia-old fairness efficiency trade-off questions are being at the operative level struck by AI every week. So it's kind of exciting. Okay, let me talk about another idea. And now we get into chains. So what would happen if there would be one person in the country who would be willing to give a kidney for nothing? Doesn't expect anything in return. What would it do in the pool? Well, it would trigger a chain instead of a cycle. And what's at the end of the chain? Well, there's the donor of the last pair of the chain, who's willing to give, but doesn't have to give to anybody. We can actually treat that donor as an altruistic donor in the next week's batch. And this, is, this one guy's gift of giving a kidney for nothing will trigger this chain that keeps going on forever. We call this the never-ending altruistic donor chain. This was actually an idea by Mike Reese, and uh, uh, with him we launched the first one of these. This is actually a picture of the first one. Um, so this, this actually went across country. Um, as you can see here, somebody from Arizona, here's Ohio, 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 Maryland, Maryland, and North Carolina, and so forth. Um, the chain doesn't have to execute atomically, unlike a cycle. Because it's okay if somebody defects and stops the chain. Too bad the gift didn't give forever, but at least nobody's out the kidney. Nobody's out there bargaining cheaper um, in the exchange. Um, there's actually a big debate as to how chains should be executing, whether these, they should be these never-ending ones, or whether you should have closed chains where you terminate the chain within the current planning horizon to the deceased donor waiting list. You can take the last guy and give his kidney to the deceased donor waiting list to save one life, versus you can continue it forever with the risk that at some point it'll stop. Um, these can be, the chain actually, as stated so far, can be modeled in the same algorithm as a cycle where we just put the fake edge of weight zero back from the last guy to the, uh, to the first guy. So the same algorithm works on this. Hang on for a second. What happens to the cap in that case? I mean, if you still have a cap of three, that would be rather unfortunate, right? So doesn't the algorithm suffer a little bit? Probably? Yes, this is something that we changed. Uh, in the original paper, the EC07 paper that I talked about, we didn't have chains. Chains hadn't been invented. Mm -hmm. So uh, since then, our algorithm that runs at UNOS, we have a different chain cap and a different cycle cap. I'm going to talk about this chain cap, whether we even should have one uh, in a moment. 
Uh, furthermore, we allow even transplant centers to say what their chain cap should be, what their cycle cap should be, and so on. So algorithm supports different caps at different parts. Okay, so here's a 30 chain. Uh, this was actually done at the National Kidney Registry. They adopted these never-ending altruistic donor chains. And the longest that's by now been done is a 30 chain. So here you have 60 people, uh, 30 donors, 30 patients. Um, uh, so these chains can go on for a long time. And typically you have multiple of these running in parallel. So you have these never-ending chains going in parallel. And they're actually so much more powerful than just cycles. Because a chain, you don't have to close. It's much easier to find matches if you just don't have to close the loop. OK, now let me come back to a study of chains. So um, this is kind of small. I hope you can see this. Uh, let's look at the uh, left first. So uh, this is on uh, two different graphs on different months from the Unis Exchange. Uh, on the x-axis, we have the chain cap, how long the chain can be. The cycle cap is still three. On the y-axis, I have the objective value. And I, we can see that until about 13, change of about 13 give additional value. If we maximize just for cardinality instead of weights, uh, we get value up to like 9 or 10. And after that, it flattens out. So what this says is that long chains, even from a batch optimization perspective, with no, no dynamics in play, are a good idea. By long, I mean longer than three. Um, in contrast, here's a theorem that says the opposite is true. Uh, so th uh, this is um, so, uh, a model where we have the blood types O, A, B, A, B. And we have tissue type incompatibility with some probability, um, let's say, less than 40 percent, uh, given blood type compatibility and uh, the assumption is we have a large unweighted graph. Then um, if we have the blood types in the same relative order as we do in the US and most other countries, uh, then with high probability the graph has an efficient allocation. That's one that saves as many patients as possible that uses only cycles of length at most three and chains of length at most three. So this says that in the large you shouldn't need long chains. So what gives? Why do we have this discrepancy between reality and the theory? Well, uh, at least three possible reasons. One is that uh, the problem is unweighted in the theorem, and the reality is weighted. Well, but that can't really be the only reason, because I only also showed you the cardinality matching, where you did get value up to 9 or 10. Second hypothesis, maybe the UNOS data is not large enough to count uh, for, the, for the theory in large to kick in. And third, maybe the uniform tissue type incompatibility model in the theory is not realistic. And I'm going to talk about some experiments on the last later. But um, here's experiments using the Sideman generator to go uh, to large. And, and here's one altruist on the left and five altruists in the middle, 10 altruists to the right. So altruists are people who are willing to give a kidney to start a chain and don't expect anything in return. Uh, we see that. Um, with one altruist, I'm, I'm varying the chain cap between one and five, already at 250 pairs, there's really no difference. And uh, here at 250, there's a little bit of difference. Here at 250, there's a little bit more difference. So um, it does suggest that the benefit of long chains does go down as the pool size grows, but it goes up the more altruists you have. In dynamic experiments, where we don't just think of a batch, but we optimize the batch. And then those uh, pairs that didn't match, they go back in the pool. Some people die. New pairs come in. New altruists come in. That's kind of the dynamic experiment framework. In there, a chain cap of four was best. So you did get some value from going from three to four. But four was already slightly better than five. And why? Well, if you have these long chains, you don't get a lot of parallelism in your stochastic try of matching the, the, to match people. While if you have shorter chains, you have more chains, more chains, more cycles, you get more parallelism. And these long chains are unlikely to execute for various reasons, for very many steps anyway. So uh, overall, it balances so that four was the optimal there. We'll talk about failures in a minute. Yeah. 
So one would guess there are not too many altruists uh, in the world, but there are quite a lot of cadavers. Does a cadaver count as an altruist? No, no. That's a good question. Question. So there's certainly way more cadavers than altruists. The number of altruists in the U.S. is today probably in the hundreds. Uh, um, while cadavers, cadaveric donors are in the thousands, if not close to 10,000. Um, the cadaveric system is totally separate. It's a totally different organization that handles that. It's actually UNAS, but a totally different part of UNAS. And you don't have any time to optimize. When somebody gets uh, into a motorcycle accident, their organs start to go bad right away. Death is really bad for your organs. <laughs> And that's why you don't have any, any time to optimize. They're actually done with dispatch rules, uh, where, with the locational preference, and, and so forth. Isn't there a long-term coma patients that they're sort of going to unplug, I guess? Do those counts altruistic? Long-term what? Like patients that have been in a coma that people are deciding that they're going to like, let die. Do those fall into the deceased donors? They fall into the deceased donor, yeah. I mean, maybe that's, a, that's an argument, maybe they shouldn't, but today that, that's where they fall. Yeah. Okay, um, let's talk about the dynamic problem now. Uh, so far we've mostly talked about the batch problem, where you think about the kidney exchange batch for this week, and you try to tease out as many matches as you can, or as high quality matches as you can, and then the world ends. But in reality it's not that way. We know that there's another week, other people are coming in, some people are dying, people who didn't get matched now, there's a good chance that they'll get another chance next week, and so forth. So may, we may even want to save some of the patients that we could match now, some of the pairs we could match now, to match in the future if we expect we can get more or better matches then. Of course, you're risking the fact that something's going to happen uh, and we never get to uh, give them a chance. So um, there's actually no good prior free online algorithm for this problem. Uh, here's a simple example. So let's say that we have uh, these pairs here and we could have a bird in the hand of a two cycle. Or we could wait and then B is going to go away and we might get this longer cycle L here. If we match with the short one, then the long guy is going to appear. And if we don't match, then nothing is going to appear. That gives you a competitive ratio of cycle cap divided by two. You could even uh, do a randomized analysis and you get the cycle cap as uh, a uh, competitive ratio of 2 minus 2 divided by the cycle cap. So if you're into competitive algorithms, you'd say, well, two, this is pretty good. I, if you have, let's say, L is 3, so it's um, 2 minus 2 over 3, that's a third. You get 33% of the matches, constant good. No. Uh, maybe if you're do, doing paging or something like that in computer systems, you can afford to get only a third. But here you're talking about human lives. You want to really get something much better than that. So we're going to have the algorithm use the distributional information which we have about tissue type and blood type. So we're not going to have an adversarial model. And full stochastic optimization would be totally unscalable here. So we're not going to even attempt that. Instead, at each step, we're going to draw sample trajectories into the future. We're going to leverage our offline algorithm to pick the best solution to each sample, each sample trajectory. And then we're going to somehow aggregate that information to pick an action to take right now. We're not going to come up with a whole policy for the future, just the current action. And then at the next time step, we're going to do it again to figure out what to do next. And here, to keep things simple, we're making action cycles instead of combinations of cycles. And here uh, we had three different algorithms for this. I'm going to just mention one of them, the best of the three. So here for each cycle in the initial graph, we set the scores to zero for those cycles. We generate scenarios of futures um, using the real distributions of tissue type and blood type and death rates and so on, which we know. Um, for each cycle in the graph, for each scenario, we solve using our algorithm, which we talked about, the optimization problem with that graph minus that cycle. And then the score of that cycle is its old score plus the value of that solution plus the value of that cycle. Then, once we've done those two loops, we use our algorithm again 
to just find a combination of cycles that maximizes the sum of those scores. And is, of course, vertex disjoint. Um, let me skip the parameter tuning for that. Um, we compared the three algorithms. They all outperform the batch approach. Dummy actions help, so you can, uh, it's actually a good idea to put an action in that says do nothing, uh, because that allows the algorithm to wait. And uh, the best of these algorithms scale to about 500 or 600 pairs. Now let me talk about the new approach to the dynamic problems. Um, and this is not just for kidney exchange. So I'd be curious if you find problems where you could use this uh, approach as well. The idea is that we're going to learn a potential for each type of graph element. For example, we can learn potentials for vertices, or we could learn potentials for edges, or cycles, or some bigger elements of the graph. And we're going to adjust the batch optimization objective by subtracting from the objective the values of the potentials of the elements that the solution uses up. In other words, we're trying to still find a good solution now, but we're going to penalize a solution for using up good th things that have good value for the future. So this is a way to take in the batch optimization approach without any runtime hit in computation the future into account. And in the paper we have theory on how much associating potentials to larger elements can help, but I'm going to skip that because that's kind of application specific, while this general template is not really kidney exchange specific. Um, I'm going to talk about an experiment where we just learned potentials on vertices. Again, we use the Seidemann generator. Um, we use the real expiration rates, which we know at 12% make it 10 years on dialysis. There are four altruistic donors, blood types A, B, A, B, and O. And there are 16 pairs based on blood type. Four kinds of donors and four kinds of patients. Four by four is 16. So we have 20 different poten potentials to learn. We're going to actually use uh, Parame ILS here from uh, Kevins and Holger's group uh, to learn the potentials. So this is kind of a, a different way of using Parame ILS. My understanding is that it's typically used to configure algorithm parameters. Here we are le learning using it to learn the potentials. And um, here are some results. Um, we're looking at bigger and bigger pools on the x-axis. On the y-axis we're uh, seeing how much improvement do we get over just the batch approach. And we're getting like 1 or 2%. And you might say, well, not that great. It's not a big improvement. And actually, uh, we might actually do better with some of Kevins and Holger's newer parameter picking techniques and parameter less. I fully expect that. But if you look at the right here, 1 or 2% is actually pretty good. Because as the problem size goes up, we can look at what fraction of the difference between the batch solution and a purely omniscient solution do we close. So if we had perfect foresight of what will happen, what fraction of that gap do we close? And we actually close, oh, oops, 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 uh, there, OK. Uh, we close about 8% at 100, but as we get to 700, we're already closing about 20% of that gap. OK, other people have also looked at the online problems related to various aspects of kidney transplantation. Big difference with both of our on online approaches is that they both use sophisticated combinatorial optimization. Both of these previous papers, they make simplifying assumptions that are so simplifying that you can actually derive the analytical solution. So you don't even need the optimizer in the loop. But we already know that even in the batch problem, the problem is NP complete in reality. OK. Now, um, last topic. This is something that I'm super excited about. This is something new, and we hopefully will get this accepted tomorrow, quite literally. But uh, yeah, uh, we'll see. Um, this is failure-aware uh, kidney exchange. And the motivation is that only 7% of the planned transplants go into execution. So I said that some of the edges will disappear on you. Actually, most of that graph is trouble. 7% go into transplant. It doesn't mean that 7% of the edges succeed and 93 fail. Because a whole cycle fails if even just one edge fails. And the rest of a chain fails if any leg of the chain before that fails. So it's not like 93 of them are fake edges. 
but the effect is that only 7% go to transplant. And this is not talking about, hey, how long do these people last after transplant? This means who's even going to go into transplant. Um, so we propose a, to find a solution that has maximum expected weight. And this is actually something that others have recently in the last two years also proposed, but they've been using CPLEX to try to solve this. And I'm going to show that that doesn't scale. So we're going to have to make a custom algorithm again to solve this. Um, so each edge has a weight as before and a success probability. And we can't multiply those together. That might be your first gut feeling. If you multiply those together, throw them to the algorithm we already know. No. Why? Because a, a cycle fails if even just one edge fails. So uh, if we just multiply them together, we would give way too much favoring to three cycles. We would ignore the fact that two cycles are more robust. So you can do the math and you can see that you can't multiply these together, two together. OK. So um, here's another theorem under our random graph model where you have the ABO blood types. You have an edge probability given blood compatibility, which is decreasing with the pool size. This is an assumption from a paper by Ashlagi and Roth, which is arguable. But this theorem is assuming the same thing. So this is basically saying that as the pool gets bigger, we have more and more, more sensitized patients that have accumulated into the pool and very sensitized. And then there's a failure probability that says that if there was an edge in the graph, what's the chance that that edge is actually going to fail between now and the transplant? In the large, there's almost surely a matching M prime of this probabilistic kind such that for all maximum cardinality matchings, this probabilistic matching is going to get way better solutions, linear in the number of pairs. So this is the motivation why this is a good idea. OK. So algorithm changes for the probabilistic setting. Now we need to make some changes. We're going to use our branch and price algorithm, but three significant changes, or three classes of changes. One is that change can't be handled as cycles with a fake edge anymore. Now we have to have something specific for change, and we have a separate chain generator now in the pricing problem. And the cool observation there is that you don't have to extend a chain by any number of steps if it wouldn't be worth extending an infinite number of steps. And the, the math there, we look at the geometric series where we use the discounts of, of the probabilities, and we compare it against the linear program dual values that the chain might use up. And we have to be careful that we use optimistic probabilities of success, optimistic values, and, and, and so forth. But even if in an optimistic case it's not worth extending the chain to infinity, then it's not worth extending any number of steps. And, and, and that allows us to really cut down on the number of chains we need to generate. Otherwise, this would be the point in the algorithm that would completely get us dead in the water. There are also ordering heuristics for cycle and chain generation, so we generate the more promising ones first. Now, unfortunately, the upper bound in the algorithm is hard, unlike it was before. So the discounted clearing problem, by discounting I mean that we take the failure probabilities into account, is NP complete even with no change and no cycle cap. So we use a looser bound where we now multiply the probability and the weight together. We know it's wrong, but it does give an upper bound. And now we can compute that in polynomial time. So we get a much looser upper bound. The lower bound is still easy. Turns out that even the discounted clearing with two cycles is polynomial time. So we do that. Scalability experiments on that. Um, we compared CPLEX on the discounted problem, and now you have to generate all of the chains explicitly. Um, and our algorithm, and you can see that CPLEX solves most of the instances of the 128 instances uh, up to 25 pairs, and then by 100 pairs, it basically solves none of them. Uh, we are solving most of them up to about, uh, what is that? 700 pairs, and then the significant drop happens between 700 and 900. And here you, you can see that whenever we solve an instance, it's actually like one second. So it's not a question of time, it's really a question of if you hit a bad instance, you're not solving it within an hour. 
Now, how, how well does this do? These are now dynamic experiments where we have a, as faithful a simulation of the kidney exchange as we can with all of the knowledge we have. Uh, in the paper, we talk about how we get all of this simulation to be as realistic as possible. And here things are happening over time. Failures happen, the fail guys go back in the pool, people die, people come in, altruists come in, and so on. On the x-axis, we have the number of the size of the kidney exchange. And this is a simulation over 24 weeks. With a traditional approach, we only get this much um, in terms of transplants. And with the probabilistic approach, we get uh, significantly more. We get like four times as many, uh, as many matches. So this is not fielded. So far, the fielded exchange is all run in the batch mode. And we're very excited about using this approach instead. So this is not a fully stochastic approach in that we're not thinking ahead. We're just thinking in a batch mode, but we're taking the probabilities into account in the batch mode. OK, let me conclude. So we talked about an algorithm that can clear kidney exchanges optimally on a national scale. And the key was the incremental formulation. So we can't write the problem down, yet we want to prove optimality. It supports several generalizations, like different cycle length and chain length caps, multiple willing donors per patient, side constraints. We didn't really talk about those, but there are many classes of side constraints that it supports, not all. Edge weights, compatible pairs, these never-ending altruistic donor chains, and so forth. Um, it does make the decisions for the UNAS nationwide kidney exchange with 130 transplant centers every week. And we've also run some of the reg regional kidney exchanges. Um, the dynamic pro uh, problem, we talked about this general purpose trajectory based online algorithms, much in the vein of Pascal van Hentenrich's uh, work. And we talked about a new general purpose idea of how we can learn potentials to capture the future into the batch optimization. So we don't take any runtime hit while these trajectory-based algorithms are very heavyweight. We can, uh, by learning the potentials, we can get rid of the runtime hit and still improve performance. All of these, both of these classes leverage the distributional information that we have at hand, and they leverage our integer programming uh, solver in the inner loop. So we don't have to take an adversarial model when, because we know the reality of the blood type and tissue type distributions and they both uh, outperform the batch-based approach. Then we talked about this new thing about robust probabilistic clearing that I'm very excited about. It is a much harder problem from a computational perspective, and we cannot get to 10,000 yet today. But we can get to 700, and the current pools are about 200. So, so we're, uh, we're good to go for now, uh, and that's not yet fielded. So last slide, the current research um, even ha faster algorithms, especially with chains and with probabilities. It would be nice if we could do the full projected 10,000 in the probabilistic sense, or maybe not even just the probabilistic sense, but the full dynamic uh, sense that does better than just learning the potentials. Learning the potentials is very scalable, but we only get like a couple of percent lift. Uh, even be uh, better online algorithms, better algorithms for dealing with cross-match failures and testing. So, so far, the model is that we make a plan and then we test to the plan. We only do the blood mixing test called cross-matching for the edges that we plan to go to transplant. But we know that most of those fails, fail. So maybe we would want to make some contingency plans proactively and test to those as well. So we get some more parallelism to the testing. But we can't possibly test all of the edges in advance because there's, that would be way too costly and there's just not enough blood in a person. <laughs> so, so, uh, so, so how should we test? And that's actually some, uh, there are a couple of uh, very theoretical papers on that already. And it would be interesting to see in, in more practical settings, how should you do that testing? Also, machine learning to predict cross-match failure. So we, this is something that we're currently taking on, is can we somehow, from the donor and the patient attributes, predict in a better way? what the probabilities are. Um, centers incentives to reveal pairs. This is a fun topic that's a real, one of the two main important problems in kidney exchange. One is the failures, and this is number two. Uh, 
you could have centers that hide some other pairs. They could say, that, okay, well, this pair I can match locally. Let me not tell the exchange about that. I'm going to just tell the exchange about the hard to match pairs. Why would the centers want to do that? Well, if you are a cynic, you say it's money because they get paid for every transplant. But there's also a more altruistic view, which is that now the failure probability is much lower because you already know these people, it's easier to test, they're there, and so on. So if the failure, if, if the chance of a transplant there local is 80%, and in the exchange it's 7%, maybe you want to go local. And this is a huge problem. We actually did a study with the UNAS personnel recently looking at how many of the pairs that they actually revealed, the 130 transplant centers revealed to the UNAS exchange, could the centers have matched locally. What's your guess at that number? What fraction? Zero. It is zero. So this is not just a hypothetical thing that some game theorists thought up as a fun problem to work on. This is actually a very real problem. So it um, turns out that from a mechanism design perspective, it's impossible to design a perfect solution to that. There are already known impossibility results that you cannot get an efficient matching and have everybody incentivized to reveal all of their pairs. So uh, we have some other schemes in mind how to do that. Um, I mean, a perfect solution in some sense would be a mandate that everybody has to reveal all of their pairs to the exchange. And it's not wildly unrealistic in that UNOS controls all of the transplantation in the US. All transplants have to be reported to UNOS anyway. But politically, especially in the US, it's not viewed as a good thing to mandate that somebody want, has to do something. So th this is kind of an open question what's going to happen on that front, and a very important one. Matching cadence. Um, there's a race to the bottom among exchanges. So the UNOS exchange is still not the only exchange in the US, although it's been grabbing these other smaller exchanges into it. Um, the, for the other big one is the National Kidney Registry, uh, uh, which is a private exchange running out of New York City. Uh, there's also the Alliance for Pair Donation. They're, while they're part of UNOS, they're also doing local matches. And there's a little bit of a problem in that if you have one of these exchanges running at a faster cadence, they're grabbing all of the easy to match cases. So it's every exchange's incentive, if you think about it from a competitive competition between exchanges perspective, to run at a faster cadence. But if you run all the time, you lose all of the value of optimization and planning ahead. You're just greedily matching again. So this is another interesting thing. Uh, again, the best solution, which many advocate, but hasn't happened yet, is that there should only be one exchange. There can't be multiple exchanges. Because right now, you have multiple exchanges and transplant centers can list their pairs to multiple of them. So if we wait a week and the National Kidney Registry runs every three hours, by the time we match somebody, they're probably already gone. And that's actually one of the, big, one of the reasons, not the bigger reasons, but one of the reasons why that success probability is only 7%. Some of our edges disappear because some other exchange has sniped the people. Um, finally, cross organ and other exchanges for other organs and cross organ. So um, turns out that you can actually take out half a liver from a person and they'll be fine. They'll grow that half back quickly. And that half you took out will grow the other half back. So you can actually uh, do live donation of liver lobes. And this has been done for a long time now. But there's no liver exchange. But there could be. It turns out that liver is actually easier from an HLA perspective, from a tissue type perspective, to match. The kidney is very persnickety about tissue type. The liver isn't. But of course, the liver is also very careful about blood type. So um, actually, some liver, some ma there was a manually matched liver cycle actually done in Asia. But there is no liver exchange. So with my student, John Dickerson, we uh, have actually built a simulator for liver exchange and built algorithms for liver exchange, because that's a little bit of a different problem, slight variations of the algorithms we talked about today. Um, 
and run some experiments. And you could also have cross-organ exchange. You could say, okay, well, I need a liver, you need a kidney. Well, okay, my spouse is going to give you a kidney and your spouse is going to give me a liver lobe. And this is actually an experiment that we ran. If we have, here's um, the time period on the x-axis and candidates matched per month on the y-axis. And we can see that the combined exchange um, matches more every month than uh, having separate kidney and liver exchanges. Kevin, your question? Well, what's up with those error bars? Uh, yeah, the error bars are pretty big. But, but <laughs> if, if you look at any one point, if you look at any one point, so that's why I, don't want, uh, that's why I said every month. You can say, that, okay, the error bars are big, but every month the average is better with the other one. So if you do like a, a side test across this, whatever, to, uh, 25, the chance that you're wrong is very small. Okay. Um, this also brings up a lot of ethical questions. So kidneys are very easy. You can do the operation laparoscopically. It's very safe and so on. But if you're a donor, you're a little bit probabilistically better off with two kidneys. Like if you get into a car accident and your remaining kidney gets pierced, would, would it be really nice to have the other one? <laughs> so you, you, you're harming the donor a little bit. So it's kind of going against the Hippocratian oath a little bit. In liver, there you have a full single digit percentage of dying in the transplant operation as a donor. So you're kind of harming the donor a little bit more. What about should you be allowed to give an eye? This is an example that Al Roth oftentimes uh, talks about. Should you be allowed to give an eye? Well, that's, I don't know where the boundary goes. And what about, let's say that your, uh, your daughter needs a kidney. Should you be allowed to give a heart for that? Thank you. Question. Question. So uh, if livers can replicate themselves, why do you need an exchange? Why? Sorry, I'm, I'm not sure I understand. Oh, so, so didn't you uh, assert that a, a liver... So a, a, liver, a liver, if you take out a lobe from the liver, the original liver will grow back the lobe if it's still inside the uh, donor. And the lobe will grow back the other part if it's inside the recipient. I see. So it's not but you still have to find okay. the donor. I mean, these don't grow on trees. So, so, okay, so you can't repeat the process and grow as many livers as you like. Uh, from the same donor? From the same donor, yeah. I don't know that that's ever been done. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. We're just pecking away at it. Other questions? Okay. No, our probabilistic algorithm would not give the perfect incentives. Nothing will. There's actually an impossibility result. Uh, that, that's, uh, not, nothing will give the perfect incentives. But our probabilistic approach will help towards that because it will give less failure in the main exchange and um, also less wait time in the main exchange. So the overall, the, the main exchange becomes relatively more beneficial and attractive than it is now. I want to be altruist or not, and I would like to have some kind of. I would like to know what the benefits I would give to the net whole network by giving my kidney or liver. Is there, like, is it, is it something you do? Like, is it, do you like give a, a list of, oh, we want those kinds of donors, or we, is it some kind of service the UNOS uh, gives? No, not at all. And this is kind of weird. Um, so to me, that would be totally fine. Uh, intellectually, it would say, it, okay, well, if you're an altruist, don't give to the deceased donor waiting list, where you're going to save one life. Give to the exchange, you're going to save potentially infinite million lives, and you're definitely saving at least one. So it's, it's like a dominating choice. 
but we're not allowed to make that argument. There's some, sort, some people's ethics are like that, that that's considered a coer coercion, that, that this type of argument of, hey, you're going to save these many lives, that's not somehow ethic ethically sound. I still don't really buy it, but that's a fact. So we are not allowed to advertise that at all. But let me chime in. One other way of understanding Alex's question is this. You know, if I'm sitting on the fence whether I want to donate my, my kidney at all, and I have this online tool where I, you know, enter some hematological data and it shows me you could potentially be saving not just one life, but a hundred lives. That could push me over the edge, right? Right. And so I guess one interesting question is, you know, with algorithms like that, you might be able to actually provide truthful information about such what-if scenarios, right? You could say, you know, all you give me is your blood type. I can guarantee to you that you are saving, if all goes well, you know, that many lives and, um, you know, an expectation maybe you're saving that many. Bingo. Yeah, that's, so, so that's exactly what we're not allowed to do. So that's but that, 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 but that, 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 is, that is what the potentials are. The, the potentials are actually the potential for an AB altruist, the potential for a B altruist. They're actually the expected values of what you can get from that altruist. So if ParamyLS comes back and says that that potential is 3.2, then uh, for, for this type of blood type, that means that you're expected to save 3.2 lives. Other questions, Nando, I think, was first. Now, going back to your, no, there being enough time to do optimization for someone who just died in a bike accident. Um, really? Because you could possibly run one of these optimizers if, you, if you're prepared to generalize the optimization problem to take into consideration timing. You could probably come up with an algorithm that runs in one minute. And that, in itself, would be more efficient than not having an algorithm at all. Or what I think, think the problem also arises is that the organ died in the street, and now I need to optimize, especially over the country, of how to transport this organ to... Yeah, yeah I, I, I don't... Um, I didn't mean to say, and I hope I didn't, that the bottleneck is the runtime of the algorithm, the optimization algorithm. No. Uh, the, the bottleneck really is about... Uh, the testing and all of that stuff, dispatch and so forth. So if you think about the cadence of this, from the time you're matched, when the algorithm says that you are giving to him, it's about six to eight weeks before that actually happens. And for a diseased donor organ, we don't have six to eight weeks. We have at most 24 hours. So it's that kind of way, that, that, that cadence of that whole operative execution which is too slow in the exchange to, to support that. So um, what, what actually happens in the disease donor um, waiting list is that you have these local dispatch centers who have very strict rules of how to dispatch. And the rules are different for different organs. And they get a call at, okay, well, here somebody's about to die. You know, then they ask a list of questions. Okay, well, I think then the eyes are good, kidney no, liver yes, boom, boom, boom. You go through the list of what's good, and then you start dispatching it and they're on the phones dispatching it. They do a local area first, then a little bit of a bigger area, and then nationwide. And they, they have priorities. And they, so it, it's like an, algor it's an algorithm, but it's not optimization. It's just dispatch. And, and there also, it's not the runtime of the algorithm. It's that when you make the offer, say, OK, well, here's this person. The eyes are good. You want to take them. It looks like you have somebody who needs them. Now, you, on the center side, the hospital side, you have a person in the loop that's going to look at that and say, well, you know, it matched the official requirements, but there's something about this person that I don't like for my patient. I'm going to reject it. It's going to bounce back, and then they're going to offer it to somebody else. So it's that offering process that's taking the time, not the runtime of the algorithm. There's a question over there. So there? Alex, I believe. Sorry. I was just going to point out something about um, what you were saying to have this online application say that someone could go in and see the benefits of them being an altruistic donor. And before Thomas said that it was just going to be on expectation, I was going to say that maybe that's not such a good thing because I could sit there and look and this week I have you know, the chance of helping eight people, but what if I wait for next week or two weeks from now, it might be even better. And I think that could have some problems. In the long run, did you see this growing in? One big system, or is it need to subdivide the territory and run parallel system? Definitely no need to subdivide the territory. 
This is already a nationwide system. So the 130 transplant centers that we have, they're all across the country. And from an optimization perspective, the whole country is going to be like 10,000 pairs. Uh, so at least for the uh, probabilistically unweighted case, we can already handle that. And the probabilistic thing, which is only an algorithm that's half a year old, I think we can still improve it and get there. So, uh, so there's definitely no reason to split it geographically. Actually, it went the other way around. So you had these individual transplant centers starting to manually run exchanges, then regional ones, and now you have nationwide. to be a donor, like on my driver's license, I can choose to be an organ donor like if I get into an accident. So maybe, maybe this could be a way to solve it. Uh, you could kind of pre-process, pre-put all your information into the system so that if you do die, then like it's, you can, the information is kind of in the algorithm to update quickly. Oh, I see. You could uh, somehow opt in to choose to donate to an exchange if you die instead. Yeah. Perhaps. I don't know what the laws are on that. But, but uh, we, we, let, let me turn it a little bit different, because that's, a, that's an interesting point. So some countries have opt-in organ donation. Some countries have opt-out. Even countries that are very similar in Europe. That makes a huge difference. And you might say, OK, well, what if we just force everybody to give their organs upon death? Oh, this whole problem would go away. There would be no reason for kidney exchange. But actually, the, there's no trend towards that direction. The trend is actually slightly away from that. So less people are giving their organs upon death. Yeah, just a general question. If you move from the, uh, from the just, just the kidney exchange and then you move to an inter-organ exchange and then if you take that to the case of the, the, the shoes and all the rest, I mean, e eventually you end up with the expected value and, and, and it's called money. And so, uh, you know, in terms of exchanging goods and all, and all the barters and so the expected value of something, it, 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 it does come down to, if you're exchanging goods like that, it, at some end of the spectrum, at the end of some spectrum, it's, it's, it's money and that's the value of money is that it, it uh, reduces the, uh, the effort to, you don't have to compute all these exchange costs, right? And so, are, are there any kind of interesting in-between points in, in the spectrum between, between money and, 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 a, and a perfect bartering system, right? And, uh, yeah, that, that's a great question. So, uh, there are economists in the US, for example, Gary Becker, who have written papers about, you know, kidney should just be sold. And the price, price is going to be right, and that's that. But it's completely illegal in the U.S. So, 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 so there's no, uh, you, you can't use money for organs. And most countries are like that. Iran is actually an interesting counterexample. It used to be illegal in, in Iran, and you had such a black market, which was really dangerous and had a lot of downsides, that they decided that it's actually better to make it legal. So if you want to do a money-based kidney exchange, it's illegal in Iran but not in the U.S. Right, right. Um, yeah. but, but if you take out the ethical dimension and just we're back to shoes and, and uh, food and whatever else, right? So. Yeah. Um, that's actually an interesting, actually more interesting than one, one might think. Uh, because then, you, you know, the money is the amount of the, well, 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 let, 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 me, let me say what, what, what I mean. So um, if you're exchanging with money, I mean, the normal argument is exactly what you said. Most people would say that if you have money, it kind of smooths out everything and everything is reduced to money and then you just have to look at the prices and everything is going to work out quite right. But it's not quite that simple. From a theory perspective, there's, in exchange, there's what's known as the Myers and Satterthwaite theorem that says that the buyers are going to underbid and the sellers are going to overask or, uh, and, and you're not going to get efficient allocation. And even if you change the mechanism so that everybody's motivated to reveal a true valuation, you still don't get efficiency. So there's nothing that gets efficiency. And in certain settings, without money, you can actually get more efficiency. This is something that I'm think, just starting to think about. So this is very speculative when I say this. But it's not totally obvious that in all settings, money-based exchange is going to lead to more efficient allocations than barter. Than barter. But I, I'm not really ready to say anything more about it. That's something that I'm still very much starting to think about. Well, that sounds like a great sentiment to close on since our slot is over as well. So let's thank uh, Dr. Santel thank once you. again.